Hi, I'm Norman Wahlberger. We've been looking at the platonic solids and today we're going to investigate the symmetry of platonic solids by looking inside them for canonical structures. I'll explain what that means, but today we'll be mostly talking about the tetrahedron. And it turns out that inside a very simple tetrahedron there's interesting additional structure that uh, connects with a very profound connection between threeness and fourness in mathematics. It has all kinds of implications in many other areas of mathematics. We'll also be touching base with uh, the symmetric group. A little bit of an introduction to that, some group theory. Okay, so our basic object, the tetrahedron today, four vertices, six edges, and four faces. Okay, and here's our sort of view here with the A1, A2, A3 vertices towards you and A4 back here. Now, this thing obviously has fourfold symmetry because there are these four vertices and there are four corresponding faces. Surprisingly, perhaps, there's also a three-fold symmetry inside this structure. And I'd like you to think about um, what that might be. Okay? So it turns out that there's three symmetrically placed structures inside the tetrahedron. And I'd like you to just give some abstract pondering and see if you can come up with what those three symmetrically placed substructures are. As a bit of a hint, if you look at two edges of the tetrahedron, then they're either adjacent, for example, this edge here and this edge here are adjacent because they meet at a vertex, or they are opposite. For example, this edge here and this edge here are opposite because they don't meet at a vertex. That's a little bit of a hint. So I'll see if you can figure that out before you go to the next slide. So here's the answer. There are three pairs of opposite edges. Okay, what do we mean here? So here is our tetrahedron again, and one pair of opposite edges is the pair consisting of this edge, A1, A2, together with this edge, A3, A4. In this picture here, this is this green edge, and here and here. Now those two edges thought of together as some kind of object or set is one of the three things that we're thinking about. The second is this second pair of opposite edges, A1, A3, that one there, which is in this case, this one here, together with A2, A4, the opposite edge down here. So here in red, this edge and this edge form a pair of opposite edges. And the third one is A1, A4, this black dotted one, and A2, A3, which in the figure here is this edge behind here, together with this edge in front. So we have these three pairs of opposite edges. And there's three such pairs. Altogether, the six edges decompose into these three groups of two edges each, each pair consisting of a pair of opposite edges. Now, note the novel convention that we are using here. These are sets. Okay, but notice that I'm not using commas to separate the elements of sets. Those of you who have been watching my Math Foundation series, we've been talking about data structures uh, there, and you'll be familiar with this idea that the essential unordered aspects of a set and also of a multiset are best denoted by not having commas. We like to reserve the commas for situations where we have a distinct order to the objects that we're considering. For example, in a list or an ordered set. Right. So it's a little bit of a, a novel convention. I will try to use this a little bit more regularly as we go on to get you used to the idea that we don't have to follow slavishly the conventions that are around, we can think about what's the right, more natural ways of representing things. It's a very nice a point of view to have. So simply the spaces here are enough, 
and we should think about these uh, elements in the set as being freely floating around. Right? There's no order involved, so we could move this one over here and this one over there, interchange them. It would still be exactly the same set. So here we have three pairs of opposite edges forming these three sets, which we can think of as being substructures or structures with inside our tetrahedron. Now some of you may very well have decided on a different way of representing essentially the same information. And there's a geometrical sort of alternative to thinking about a pair of opposite edges. For example, the pair A1, A2, right here, together with A3, A4, which is over here, that pair of opposite edges can be also represented geometrically by a line through the midpoints of those edges. So if we denote by M the midpoint of this edge A1, A2, and by N the midpoint of this edge A3, A4, then between those two midpoints there's a line. And it's really a transversal. It's a line that's joining this line and this line transversely. In other words, it's actually perpendicular to uh, both of these edges. So let's have a look here. Okay, so we have uh, uh, A1, A2 here, and A3, A4 uh, here. And here are the two midpoints that we're talking about. Okay, and we're talking about this line here, the line joining those two midpoints. And that's actually a transversal between these two skew lines in three-dimensional space. Right? So this line, the entire line determined by these two vertices, and this entire line, these are two skew lines in the sense that they're lines in three-dimensional space which do not intersect. Now, in general, if you have two skew lines in three-dimensional space, then there will be exactly one transversal, one other line which is sort of the shortest possible distance or quadrants between the two lines. Right? And that's exactly what we're getting here. This line joining the two midpoints is perpendicular to both this line and this line. It's a nice exercise to convince yourself of that just by staring at things. And uh, it's actually the representing the shortest uh, distance or shortest quadrants between the two lines. Transversal. So there are three such transversals. There's the line joining those pair of opposite edges, and there's also the line joining those pair of opposite edges, and the line joining those pair of opposite edges. So the three transversals, one, two, and three. And they are geometrical representations of really the same essential structure. So whether one wants to think about having a pair of opposite edges or whether one wants to think about the corresponding transversal, they are, in some sense, pretty well the same thing. Although geometrically, they're different. And notice that these three transversals all meet at the center of the tetrahedron. And when they do so, you can convince yourself that they're actually um, perpendicular. That's a kind of an interesting exercise to uh, convince yourself of. These three transversals meeting in the center are like three perpendicular axes. We're touching base here with a very simple but kind of profound fact. The relationship between threeness and fourness. More precisely, that threeness is obtainable from fourness. Okay, what does that mean? So it means that threefold symmetry is actually contained inside fourfold symmetry. We started off with the fourfold symmetry of the tetrahedron, and inside we found these three objects which were symmetrically placed. In fact, this situation occurs in many different areas of mathematics and really has a combinatorial aspect which is perhaps even simpler than the tetrahedral three-dimensional aspect. So if we just have four points, say, in the plane, one, two, three, four, then we can think about subdividing that set of four points into two subsets of two each. Okay? So we're thinking about how we can subdivide the original set of four points into two subsets of two each. And there are exactly three ways of doing that represented by these sets here. So one, two, 
and 3, 4. So this pair and this pair, represented by these sort of green regions, is one way of separating the original four points into two subsets, each with two elements. The black one, represented by this subset and this subset, subset 1, 4, and subset 2, 3, that's another way of decomposing the four points into two subsets of two each. And then there's the third way, the red way, which takes one subset to be 1, 3, and the other subset to be 2, 4. That's the third way of subdividing four points into three. It's very simple, very elementary, but it's quite a profound thing, actually. And to maybe give you a bit of appreciation for that, here's a little fun exercise. Suppose that you have three friends, and one of you uh, gets to uh, have a free beer. And you want to flip a coin to decide which of the three is going to get the free beer. Okay, but there's three of you, and you only have a two-sided coin, which will give you a heads or a tails. So if there were only two of you, that'd be easy. You just flip the coin once and you, somebody would call heads and whoever would get the, head, the right thing would uh, get the beer. But if there's three of you, how are you going to use that coin, just flipping that coin, to fairly pick one of the three? And how do you do it most efficiently? Can you do it just with two tosses of the coin? Okay, so now let's connect with symmetries of the tetrahedron. So let's call our three transversals T1, T2, T3. So somewhat arbitrarily, we'll say that the green transversal, which is associated to A1, A2, and A3, A4, that one there, we'll call that T1. And T2, one associated to A1, A3, and A2, A4, in other words, that transversal right there, the red one, call that T2. And T3 will be associated to the black line here, the transversal connecting the midpoint of A1, A4 with the midpoint of A2, A3. All right, so we talk about the three transversals of this tetrahedron. And now we observe that any symmetry of the tetrahedron, like the rigid motions we were talking about in our last video, will permute the set of transversals. If we take a rigid motion of the tetrahedron, for example, this rotation here. Well, that will send one transversal to another transversal, or possibly keep that transversal where it is. It will not take the transversal and move it to some other line. So any symmetry actually ends up permuting these three transversals. So for example, let's consider the rotation, one of the rotations, about an axis through A1. So here's A1 up at the top, and the axis of the rotation, I remind you, it goes through the vertex to the center of the opposite face. So let's consider the uh, rotation, perhaps that uh, row that uh, takes uh, A1 to itself, that takes A2 to A3, A3 to A4, and A4 to A2. In other words, that rotation. Okay, so talking about the rotation of the tetrahedron with the axis here, which is a third of a turn. A third of a turn when the direction of the axis is sort of positively oriented in that direction. Okay, so here is our convention for the way we're going to write the action of this rigid motion on the vertices. So we'll say that A1 times rho is A1, meaning that rho takes A1 and gives us a1 back. It doesn't change A1. A2 rho equals A3. It's telling us that this rho acting on A2 gives us A3, and so on. So notice that we're writing the operations as symbols to the right of the things that they're acting on. So we're kind of reading from left to right. We start with A2, we perform rho, we get A3. We start with A3, we perform rho, we get A4. This way we're reading left to right, which is convenient. Okay, so now let's think what happens to the three transversals when we perform this particular rotation. Alright, so in this diagram, 
A1 is fixed and A2 gets sent to A3, A3 gets sent to A4, and A4 gets sent to A2. So what happens to T1? Well, T1 was this green transversal right here. So what happens to those, uh, those midpoints? Well, this midpoint, midpoint here, this segment, this one goes to this one, so this midpoint is going to go to that point right there. And this midpoint between A3 and A4 is going to get rotated to the midpoint between A4 and A2, which is down here. So this segment, the green one, that transversal, is getting mapped to the red segment, which is T2. So T1 rho equals T2. And I'll leave it to you to check that T2 rho equals T3, and T3 rho equals T1. So that the effect of this rotation, uh, this one here, is to cyclically permute our three transversals. Okay, uh, and then an exercise. What happens if we look at one of the other kinds of rotations of the tetrahedron that we talked about? So for example, if we take our transversal uh, T1, the, the green one, which is the actual line through those two points, and we perform a one-half turn rotation through that axis. What does that rotation about this T1 do to the three transversals T1, T2, and T3? It will have a different effect, and what is it? So given a symmetry of the rigid body, we now have a corresponding permutation of our three transversals inside the tetrahedron. So we're bumping up now to a little bit of group theory. In particular, the study of the symmetric group, usually called S3. So there are six permutations of a three set. For example, our set of three transversals of the tetrahedron, T1, T2, T3. There are six possible ways of permuting or rearranging those three objects. Now, what makes the subject a little bit tricky sometimes for beginners is that there are actually quite a lot of different ways of representing and even, in fact, defining what we mean by these permutations. So, for example, the permutation that we've just been considering is the one that takes T1 to T2, T2 to T3, and T3 to T1. So certainly one way of representing that permutation is to draw a little diagram like this with some arrows that tell you what happens to each of the objects when we apply this transformation or permutation. Another way of specifying that same piece of information is with a little matrix here that has two rows. Uh, the first row typically one, two, three. And then below it, the results of what happens to the three objects when you apply the transformation. So T1 gets sent to T2 is represented by the fact that underneath the 1, there's a 2. T2 is sent to T3 is represented by the fact that underneath 2, there's a 3. And 3 goes to T1 is represented by this 3 over that 1 there. It's another way of encoding the information. Now you might say, well, okay, we... We're doing, putting some rows here, but we could just as well have organized this in terms of columns. We could just as well have put the column 1, 2, 3 here, and then the column 2, 3, 1 adjacent to it, which represents the fact that T1 goes to T2, T2 goes to T3, T3 goes to T1. Now, another way of encoding the same kind of information is with something called cycle notation, which is a special kind of uh, thing that... Uh, you write down 1, 2, 3, and the meaning of this in this particular case is that the object 1 goes to 2, the object 2 goes to 3, and the object 3 goes back to the initial one, which is 1. Now, usually when we write cycle notation, we don't have these little red arrows telling us which way to go because that's understood, okay? But um, anyway, that's another way of representing the same in piece of information. Now... There's actually also variants to this. Like, suppose that we had a look at this uh, matrix here and said, well, okay, the essential aspect of this situation is that we know that 1 goes to 2, that 2 goes to 3, and 3 goes to 1. What's really important are the rows of this matrix. 
And if we interchange the rows, that's really not losing the information. So somebody might want to come along and say, let's, for some reason or another, rearrange the rows so that the 3, 1 row is up there, the 2, 3 row is still where it is, and the 1, 2 row is now at the bottom. One could argue that this matrix also contains exactly the same information about the permutation, still telling us that T3 goes to T1, T2 goes to T3, and T1 goes to T2, just not presenting the information in the sort of systematic way that we started off over here. Now you might say, well, why would we want to do that? Okay, but one reason you might want to do that is because you might want to go one step further and do a, another variant on this, where now you've rearranged the rows again, but so that the second column is organized one, two, three. So we still have row three, one, we still have a row one, two, we still have a row two, three. Still contains the information that T3 goes to T1, T1 goes to T2, and T2 goes to T3, but now it's kind of organized so that the right column is in ascending order. And I think you can appreciate that it's really just a matter of taste, whether we want this to be the standard way of thinking about things, or this. So we have to allow the possibility that maybe this is uh, one way of representing permutations, but maybe also this might be another way of representing permutations. Okay, so if we go back to this one here, or maybe even back to the, the earlier one there, another way of thinking about this is to say, well, there's actually some redundancy here. I mean, if we're going to agree that the first row is one, two, three, then it's really only the second row that matters. And we could encode the permutation by just listing that second row as a, an ordered set. So we're going to put some commas there now. So this represents an ordered set where there's a first one, namely two, a second one, namely three, and a third one, namely one. So I can say that this ordered set contains the same information as this matrix, it's just a little bit more efficient. Or you could say it contains the same information as this matrix, except instead of having this column here, we have this row. But that means that somebody else can come along and say, all right, well, let's do the same thing with this matrix. This one, two, three here on the right, that's kind of redundant if we're always going to have that in ascending order. So the essential information is actually in the column three, one, two, which we can represent as an oriented sequence or set three, one, two. So somebody with this point of view would tend to write down the permutation in this fashion, while someone with this point of view would write it down in this fashion. And notice that these are actually quite different. So, this diversity of points of view leads us to the possibility that there might be actually distinctly different ways of representing the same permutation. It's not just necessarily one God-given way of representing a permutation. And behind this is really maybe the more fundamental question about what do we mean actually by a permutation? We've been talking a little bit informally here, but the reason why we have all these different specifications or possible ways of thinking about it is perhaps because we haven't been clear enough about what we actually mean by a permutation. Now, those of you who are watching my Math Foundation series, which I hope is many of you, will know that one of the things that I stress in that series is the importance of defining everything. Okay? And that includes rather foundational everyday, very common objects like function and sequence. So the fact that we don't define precisely what a function is or a sequence is, etc., is a, a serious weakness in modern mathematics. And we have to be careful that we're not incorporating that difficulty here in the discussion of permutations. So it's not enough to say, well, a permutation is a function from a set to a set that has some property. Unless we've defined previously what exactly we mean by a function. Right, so if we haven't done that, then there's something problematic about our definition of permutation, clearly. Okay, so let's proceed 
rather informally. Okay, so let's just sort of say, well, down the road, we're going to have to be more clear about what we mean by permutations, just as we're going to have to be more clear about what exactly symmetries are. In fact, we're going to have to be more clear about what the actual objects that we're talking about are. So right now, they're just physical objects, and we're just transforming them physically. But informally, what we see is that we have described a way of going from symmetries of the tetrahedron to permutations of the set of transversals of the tetrahedron. And that's a set with three elements. There's our picture, there's our tetrahedron with the three transversals. Given any symmetry of the tetrahedron, the transversals are going to be permuted amongst themselves, so we're going to get a permutation of T1, T2, T3. And notice the direction of the arrow. We start with the symmetry, then we get a permutation of the transversals. And a good exercise for you to think about, combining some of the uh, things we've been talking about today, is what are all the permutations that we can get of the transversals of this little three element set by considering these rigid motions of the tetrahedron? Do we get, for example, all permutations, or just some subset of them? Okay, so we have a good basis now for going ahead to the more complicated, uh, richer situations of the cube and octahedron and the dodecahedron and icosahedron, where the same kinds of uh, reasoning apply, but the situations become more interesting and richer, and that's what we'll be uh, doing next time. So we're going to be carrying on uh, towards the cube and the octahedron uh, in our next lecture about canonical structures within those. I hope you'll join me for that. I'm Norman Wahlberger. Thanks for listening.